I'm Parker Castleberry. This is the possible photochemical origins of banded iron formations. So just some introduction and background. First, our story starts in space. You have an exoplanet. You want to find life on it. OK, that's great. Let's look for something in the atmosphere, um, say oxygen. Easy to detect spectroscopically uh, and associated with life. But the thing is, we're not entirely sure exactly what controls its buildup in the atmosphere. So to do that, we look at the Earth, uh, specifically like the Great Oxidation Event. So about two and a half billion years ago, Earth's oxygen rose dramatically. Um, and the, the environment went from neutral to oxidizing. So, and the details of this, though, are kind of puzzling. Uh, and the more we find, the more the mystery deepens. Uh, for example, evidence of global atmospheric oxygen is about 2.5, 2.4 billion years old. But we have evidence of just oxygenation on a local scale at 3 billion years ago. So the more we investigate, the more this, like this. Um, and all these investigations, though, rely on geochemical proxies, uh, some of which are very subtle effects of effects of oxygen. Um, but what's often ignored is photochemistry, the potential for ultraviolet light to cause this oxidation. Uh, and there was no ozone layer back then, too. So this might completely be confounding our detective work. So one of these signs of oxygenation, and really big ones are banded iron formations. They're layered sedimentary deposits of iron oxides. Um, the oldest are actually well before the Great Oxidation event, uh, but most are leading up to it. Uh, so they're classically thought to be formed by oxygen turning aqueous iron 2 into iron 3. But there's more to the story. Um, so there's something called photoferrotrophy, which is a alternate idea. So it's anoxygenic photosynthesis that directly oxidizes the iron. Um, and there's been experiments that have shown that this could make BIFs. But then there's also photooxidation. You have an ultraviolet photon knocking an electron off of aqueous iron 2, turning it into iron 3. Iron species like FeOH plus have very broad UV absorbance. Uh, so that gives some interesting results. So making a biff with light. You have dissolved iron in seawater from a hydrothermal vent, and then FeOH plus to absorb a photon. Electron gets knocked off. You form iron hydroxides. That electron creates hydrogen gas by combining with H plus in solution. And then things precipitate. And then over time, you get the minerals of a BIF. Uh, so the implication here is that you don't need oxygen or even biological activity. So then are these banded iron formations really signs of oxygen, life, or are they completely abiotic? Uh, so how to test this experimentally? Uh, previous work has been done. Um, late 70s, it was first proposed. And then in 83, there were simple experiments uh, that found that it could more than account for BIFs. Um, in 92, more complete simulations concluded the same. Uh, and in 2007, under completely different conditions, but more complete, they concluded that it would be minor compared to photoferrotrophy. Um, but all these experiments are very different. Um, they used different compositions of their seawater, simple versus complex mixtures. Um, iron concentrations were in order of magnitude different. Um, they used different light sources, one of which having a 100 nanometer band gap right in the middle of the UV spectrum. Um, and they concluded different things. But then there was actually a direct conflict. Um, the 83 paper, they tested different wavelengths of UV light specifically and they found that UVA causes precipitation. 
That's where the FeOH plus absorbance is. Um, but the later paper, they tested UVA specifically in a simple solution as the previous experiment and found absolutely no effect. That is the red line on the graph. The black line is their control. Yeah. Um, major conflict. So then, this is where I come in. Uh, so my experimental objectives are to test this photochemical mechanism, get quantitative rates by measuring iron loss in solution, and compare that to estimated rates of actual BIFs, and hopefully help resolve the current dispute in the literature. Uh, so what I'm doing differently is having realistic best estimates of seawater composition. Um, haven't quite figured that out yet. Want to make sure I can actually get things working first. Um, but that could affect speciation. Um, other non-iron species can absorb. And also, there's great potential for dark reactions between oxidized iron and other components. So the other thing, I'm having more rigorous control of my atmosphere and temperature. Uh, previous experiments, some of them did not control their temperature at all. Um, and I'm using something called a solar simulator. So solar simulator is a powerful light source. Uh, I have a Xeon arc lamp that recreates the solar spectrum with special filters. Um, and I'm using one for the extraterrestrial spectrum to simulate an Earth with no ozone, as I said before. Um, there we go. Um, so this is my setup. Um, there I have my solar simulator, some optics. Um, there's a beam turner, which is a really fancy name for a 45 degree mirror. Um, there's my glass chamber, and I have this big machined Teflon lid that bolts on with 10 bolts. It was a pain. Um, water cooling jacket to control temperature. Um, Sensors, pH, and oxygen sensors with the USB sensor interface. So I can just walk away and have the computer continuously log data for me. Um, all this tubing for a gas system. Um, so then, my initial experiments. I tested simple solutions of iron salt bicarbonate buffers, um, basically repeats of the previous experiments. Uh, Sealed it with a positive pressure for PSI, so hopefully if anything gets in, it'll get pushed out. Uh, ran for over 18 hours. And this is what I saw. Isn't it beautiful? You can see the iron precipitation there and all over in the water. I was so excited. Um, here's loss. Um, so this is iron remaining in solution um, over time. That's what it looked like. <laughs> yeah. Um, the only reason why that point is out there is this was on a weekend and I wanted to sleep in, so I didn't come in as early to sample it. Uh, but so basically, um, the dark control showed exactly as much precipitation as the uh, experiment with the light on. Um, and so essentially, what happened is um, my oxygen sensor also rose to about 10% of atmospheric oxygen. So I was leaking oxygen significantly, um, which was quite worrisome. Um, but at least I confirmed that oxygen makes iron precipitate. <laughs> I confirmed that. I convinced myself of that. Um, so my colleagues went to our house university in Denmark to do experiments um, with a group who does, they have this really fancy, uh, extremely sensitive oxygen detector. And in doing that, they realized that their setups were not nearly as oxygen tight as they thought. Uh, so they've designed extremely oxygen tight um, experiments. So I'm learning from them. Um, Essentially, what they said is that plastic, which I used a lot of because I wanted to avoid using like metal because I was working with iron, um, 
Turns out that plastic is extremely permeable to oxygen. So, yeah, that was kind of bad. But uh, the good news is, is that glass is actually, um, oxygen does not permeate well through it, so you can build a nice reactor out of glass. Um, so right now I'm working with the glass shop to build something like this. This is just a shiny 3D model. Um, so the interesting things, pH, oxygen sensor ports, um, there's quartz window to let the light in, uh, stopcock and septum for headspace sampling. Remember how I said earlier that this reaction produces hydrogen? I want to try to sample the headspace to look for that hydrogen so that I confirm that I have chem photochemistry going on. Um, this entire thing can be placed in a water bath hooked to a chiller for temperature control. Because um, it will heat up, it is getting hit with the power of the sun. So, and then this is an interesting, this injection and sample port. So mix things up, um, the seawater separately, deoxygenate it, and then inject it in to the chamber uh, through this long skinny tube. And you don't even have to seal it. It's so long and thin that it will take oxygen longer than the course of the experiment to diffuse down it. Um, but when you want to sample it, you just stick a needle right down in there. Um, it's absolutely genius. Thank the guys in Denmark for that. Uh, so I expect some amount of iron precipitation due to photooxidation to occur, as has been seen in the simple experiments, uh, once I get all oxygen out. Uh, more complex solution depends on um, speciation and dark reactions, um, especially like if I add in some um, organic carbon that could interact with the iron. So hopefully I'll answer if BIFs can be made by UV light, which would take the first step in investigating photooxidation, how it might affect our geochemical oxygen proxies in general. So then, with that I shall ask for questions. Okay, we have time for a oh, few questions, yes. Great talk. Um, you may already know what questions I'm going to ask because we briefly discussed at the banquet. Um, I'm interested in actually kind of two things. First off, what kind of pHs you're going to be trying to keep um, your solution at? Um, because it definitely depends, you know, with microbes especially, um, are much faster um, at oxidizing iron at very low pHs than even oxygen is. Um, and also, how you're going to also sterilize to make sure you're not getting microbes in there. Um, I don't so, know if the UV light is sufficient. Yeah. As for sterilization, uh, I haven't exactly thought about that, but I do wash this with 50% um, hydrochloric acid in between. So it, it, the glassware is acid washed to um, remove the iron in between experiments. So that'll get uh, a lot of things out. Um, <laughs> but, and then as for pH, um, the thinking is that things were relatively neutral back then, um, so that's what I'm shooting for. Um, I actually broke the pH sensor for those experiments because it's this really long, skinny glass thing. Um, so I don't have pH data for that, but. Okay, okay. next question. Oh, uh, never mind. Hi. So in the Archean Ocean, when you precipitate iron, you don't get a pure iron oxide. You get an iron silica co-precipitate or gel because the ocean is super saturated in silica. So I saw that in the complex solutions of Kahnhauser, they have silica in that complex solution. They do. And then the other ones don't have the silica. Right. So I'm wondering if you've considered the role of silica and the discrepancy between the two, and if you're going to try to model our keen seawater more with further that, experiments. That is one thing that I most definitely want to do, including silica. Um, so I never actually thought about that effect on the precipitation that you mentioned. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the other experiments didn't have it. So that very well could be a cause for discrepancy. Mm -hmm. Or the other numerous things that they have different. OK, real quick. Yeah, I just have a simple question. I might have just uh, missed it. But what was the half reaction that you were making the hydrogen gas on? Uh, it was an electron combining with um, 
H plus in the water, just an H plus. Okay, let's give Parker another round of applause. Hey. And then